Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, welcome to our first Friday session this October, featuring 2022 F Award winner Andrew Mary. So originally from New Zealand, Dr. Andrew Mary completed both, uh, both his master's and PhD in sustainability science at the Stockholm uh, Resilience Center in Stockholm University. At Planethon, his work focuses on applying insights from science to support sustainable transformation. This involves a combination of science, imagination, and storytelling to build features, literacy, and transformational strategies for companies and organizations. Uh, Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. I hope everyone can hear me now and we can see the screen. Uh, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, what's really exciting about uh, this opportunity to speak to this audience, of course, is that I don't need to go into the details of what scenarios are or what futures are or why they're important, because uh, obviously all of us are here uh, because we hold those beliefs. So what I'm going to do today is go through the particular project um, that I won the IF award for um, in two categories for future images and imaginaries and also an impact. So I'll try to uh, go through both of those. So what I'm going to do uh, is go through the kind of origin of the project and then sort of step through it and, and the different elements of it. Uh, and then I'll share a little bit about the, the impact uh, and also what are some of the follow-on projects. And then probably the most exciting thing at the session is looking forward to the Q&A and the discussion that we can have together uh, from hearing about other people's perspectives and views on these areas. So without further ado, I'll get going. So... I really like to use this quote and appropriate to futurists and, and what I'm going to be talking about in terms of science fiction prototyping, how inappropriate it is to call this planet Earth when it's quite clearly ocean uh, by Arthur C. Clarke. And indeed, you could imagine almost, I mean, maybe not with so many lights on Earth these days, but if an alien species was to arrive above the planet and look at it, they might assume that intelligent life would live under the oceans. Maybe it still does. There's a lot we still don't know about the oceans. So what I want to do before I go into the project, I think it's really important to explain the kind of context as to why I have applied this kind of imagination led futures approach and the context of my academic work on the future ocean. Uh, you know, why is that necessary? Now, um, to start off, if we want to talk about the Anthropocene Ocean, and how the ocean has changed and how it continues to change really fast, we need to kind of introduce this idea of the Anthropocene. Uh, as was mentioned in my introduction, part of my time I spend uh, at the Stockholm Resilience Center, and there the approach to science is based on complex systems thinking and, and connecting social and ecological factors together, and also trying to understand how the Earth system is changing and what the implications of that are. And of course, this Earth system isn't just changing by itself, it's changing in co-evolution uh, and as a result of the pressures of human civilization on the planet. So the idea of the Anthropocene is that we've in fact entered a new geological epoch. We've shifted from these last 10,000 years of unprecedented climate stability into this new era, uh, an era where humans are the main driver of change on climate and the environment. And this has big implications, not least of which is in the oceans. And of course, if we've changed the way the world works, then we need to change the way that we think about it also. So I just want to go through a couple of kind of context setting pieces uh, for the ocean. Uh, so one way to think about this is the ocean has moved from being infinite or, well, rather, the perception of it as being infinite, wild and, and seemingly inexhaustible to finite, fragile, and filled with trash. Um, there's really interesting dynamics here if we think about fisheries as a good example of the kind of pressures that humans are putting on the ocean. Uh, we've sort of fished down the food webs and extracted a lot of different species and, and many of the most important species for the functioning of marine ecosystems are really, really under pressure. Um, and you can also see that one of the challenges with many natural resource uh, dilemmas in the case of uh, the oceans, the second figure shows that the reported catch is much, much lower than the actual catch. So there's a lot of illegal fisheries and different activities going on in the ocean. You know, you can describe the ocean as being kind of like the 
and, and especially these high seas, these areas of the ocean which are beyond the control of any particular country as being the wild west. Uh, it's a little bit like a final frontier. So there's a lot of frontier dynamics, a lot of companies and different people going out there and uh, fishing illegally and uh, many, many different things happening um, out in that space. So it's a very, very dynamic space. But it's also really difficult for people to kind of grapple with the ocean. It's very huge. It's very far away from many people. It's deep. You can't see what's happening under the surface. Uh, so it's something that really with the project that I'm going to describe, it's about trying to bring a lot of these different dynamics uh, to life. The ocean also right now uh, is under a lot of pressure. Uh, and one of the two main ones there is that we're facing kind of a lot of warming in the ocean, um, which is starting to change the way that the hydrological cycles work and the the currents that move around the ocean. Uh, and, and there's a number of different uh, sort of heat waves that are happening in different parts of the ocean. We often associate heat waves with, with land or in cities or forest fires, but they also happen in the ocean and they can have big impacts. Uh, the ocean heat wave that you're probably most familiar with is uh, the impact on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, where it gets bleached by huge amounts and then sort of takes quite a long time to recover. And each time it's recovering, it's taking a longer time to do so. Um, and at the same time, there are these tipping elements. So this is a really critical element from science that we have acknowledged that both on land and in the ocean, there are these uh, kind of parts of the climate system that if we push them too far then they switch they risk going into another state which is often not as good for humans so uh, less ecosystem services less goods that we can take uh, from ecosystems and they often don't function a really good way to think about this um, is if you shift a flourishing coral reef that has lots of fish on it can provide livelihoods for people uh, to sort of a algal dominated sort of uh, area where the coral has essentially died uh, and it doesn't offer anywhere near as much benefits for humans, not to mention what it does to the ecosystem itself. So to say that one of the contexts uh, for this project is really the state of the ocean and how fast the science is moving and how much there's science there is on all sorts of different dimensions uh, to try to get a sense of, of what's going on. At the Stockholm Resilience Center and in my PhD and all the other researchers that we work with, we like to say that when we look at the ocean, we look at it from corals to corporations. So we start out trying to understand all the different fundamental ecosystem dynamics and things that are going on, uh, from seawater temperature to diseases to uh, invasive species to nutrients. This is often agricultural runoff, like nitrogen and phosphorus that goes into the ocean and makes it more um, like can lead to a loss of oxygen all the way up to the impact of the finance sector, to governance institutions, to the role of technology, to geopolitics, to human migration. So for all of you guys who work in futures and foresight, I think it's very clear that when you look at this figure, there's a lot here uh, to explore and to try to get a handle on if we want to say something meaningful about the future of the ocean. And so really the core then goal is to describe and analyze what this new epoch uh, of humanity means for the ocean, what it entails for how we study marine systems, and what can be done to improve sustainability. And I think one way to really see this and, and the, is to think about the ocean as it used to be, a very simple set of interactions um, between kind of humans and, and nature, uh, and between different parts of the ecosystem and the uh, sort of global earth system. Whereas now you can see that if you take that corals to corporations uh, idea and bring that out into what's actually happening in the ocean and the kinds of interactions, uh, you can see that it's many, many, many more things going on at once. And of course, as we know, when you have many interactions in a system, you can also have things that uh, emerge and unexpected surprises and different kinds of changes and, and lots of non-linearity. So it's not very easy. You can't linearly predict exactly what's going to happen based on all these interactions. And you can see that there's right now a lot of kind of pressure and even more things happening in the ocean. The ocean could be the new gold rush, can offshore fish farming feed a hungry world, ocean desalinization. What happens if we fertilize the, the oceans with iron, like geoengineering, these new undersea cables? 
uh, all of these different things. There's a lot going on. There's this constant buildup of pressure. And this is both pressure, but also this view of the oceans as being this huge opportunity space, a chance for us to try to fix all of the problems that we've created on land and this new kind of frontier for the blue economy. And you can see that this is an adaptation of a graph we quite often use to describe what's happened um, for the Earth system as a whole, that there has been this blue acceleration, this very exponential increase from things like offshore farming to desalinization uh, to extracting sand from coastal areas to uh, the technology available for uh, deep sea mining. So many of these things are happening. Uh, and again, if we want to try to get a handle on these kinds of things, this is where the role of kind of futures and foresight can be really, really important. And all of this, and if you guys are listening to this feeling a bit overwhelmed and like, oh my God, you've gone through so much stuff in such a short time about the oceans. That's how I felt when I was about halfway through my PhD, when I was part of an international program uh, called the Nereus program that had the idea to predict the future ocean. And I was expected to uh, contribute by writing a PhD around governance of that changing ocean, governance of the future ocean. And, and how do you actually do that? How do you say something kind of meaningful? Uh, and where do quantitative analytical approaches not give you what you actually need to make sense of this? So to continue then, you can see that with all of this blue acceleration, this increase in pressure, this changing in how we see the ocean, it leads to this big multitude of overlapping claims. Um, across food and material and space. And all of these are sort of jostling to try to take um, take space and to be part of those ocean futures. Which ones are going to be prominent? Which ones are going to recede into the background? How does human use of the ocean change? And especially in the context of technology and with the shifting of the ecosystems and the entire system of the ocean as a whole. So there's really right now this race to define the future ocean economy um, through these kind of established and emerging industries uh, that are really important. Because a lot of what I did in my PhD was really the intersection between what is happening with formal governance institutions, uh, how are they responding to what's happening with respect to ecosystem change, uh, and how is the private sector and other actors trying to kind of lay claim to the future of the ocean. So that kind of whistle-stop tour of the global ocean is to give you some context for how I kind of got to this point of the Radical Ocean Futures project and why I felt that using science fiction might indeed be a academically justifiable but also necessary approach uh, to make sense of it. So as I said, it was during my PhD, I was trying to write a paper where I was going to look at the evolution of marine science over the past 10 or 15 years. And I had hundreds of different scientific papers. I'd done an analysis of 10 years of uh, fishing magazines that focused on the evolution of the fishing industry. I'd done an analysis of a bunch of different technologies. So I built this really powerful evidence base, but it was really struggling to work out how do I say anything uh, interesting from this? How do I do an analysis? And it was then that my supervisor said, well, why don't you sort of try to write a you know write a story and and try to like bring all of these things together so that was when i wrote um the first draft of one of the ocean futures stories and then from that point on then i discovered that there was in fact a method that could support me science fiction prototyping so this approach started uh, this project started with a scientific paper um which uses the classic two by two science um, scenario typology, some very kind of low quality uh, graphics. And it was a fine paper, but it, but it really, I really felt at that time, if you wanted to kind of make sense and be able to do something really impactful, uh, we would need to move beyond the limitations of scientific papers. And this is also working against the fact that I worked a lot in science communications during my PhD. And there's still this very naive sense amongst many scientists that if you just release a really compelling graph, if you just put out uh, a really exciting finding, it will automatically be taken up and change the world. But I think I've come to the realization uh, that the combination of futures, but also working with 
with media and, and art and other ways to act, has a, a better chance of actually reaching people and trying to get your message across. So now to dig down a little bit into the project as a whole, and I'll take a step back to say, what is science fiction prototyping? So science fiction prototyping uh, is really about describing and exploring the implications of futuristic technologies and the social structures enabled by them. Uh, it was a, it has, of course, a long legacy in terms of futures, and it's not that it meant like popped out of nowhere. But um, Brian David Johnson, the first futurist at Intel, applied this kind of approach to support engineers in Intel to think more humanistically uh, about the implications of the technologies that they were developing. Uh, because often, you know, technology can be developed in a vacuum. Um, and what I really found appealing about science fiction prototyping is that often foresight work, or rather working with scenarios within a scientific perspective, often they don't really know how to deal with technology. It's sort of just one of the scenarios just magically has a bunch of technology, which somehow makes things better, but they don't really engage with it in a deep way. So it's like, I have the knowledge on kind of ecosystems and evolving governance structures and what's happening in the industry. And this approach can really help me think about how technology can uh, along with all of those other factors, what that might mean for the future of the ocean. Uh, and so I felt that this was a really good good approach. And it was a great chance to kind of balance uh, science and the rigor of building a strong scientific evidence base with storytelling, imagination, and creativity. And you can see here uh, in this kind of um, version of the method that it really is about constantly balancing between uh, the, the science that informs the thinking and how you're developing these cluster of ideas and trends and signals that form uh, these future scenarios while adding different elements and using narrative to really bring that to life through scene setting, character development, evocative details, and so forth. Uh, and of course, narrative also helps you to think about what are the different kinds of inflection points or ways that you need to, how, how change really happens. So, with that being the method, how did we actually construct the scenarios? As I said, I started off by using a classic kind of two by two uh, typology, um, which many of you will be familiar with, across two dimensions, an ecological and a social dimension. We had a lot of discussions about what are, what should actually be the axes and what kind of makes sense. Uh, and we decided that the rough way that we would construct these different scenarios is to have the dimension of ecology uh, to either be more like collapsed or sustained uh, and the social dimension to be more about is it socially fragmented and if you think about this from a governance perspective it's like are things is governance able to actually take action and help to craft uh, a setting for which they can drive the future ocean or is it private actors or others who end up being able to fill that space in the vacuum of sort of formal institutions but when I develop this, I also like to think of this being more like a scenario space. Like the four scenarios that I created sit somewhere within this space, but there's many more possible alternate futures. So I'm not trying to claim that these are the futures. And again, the purpose of this is not to predict, but to present like different alternate futures of the ocean that together bring a lot of different elements. And they, in some ways, could all be part of the same future in different ways, right? The ocean is a big space. So the oceans are back back from the brink, fishing, rhyme of the last fisherman, rising tide. Uh, one thing that was really useful for me when I started this process of trying to combine kind of a more rigorous uh, process with being creative uh, was to use a particular kind of narrative form to help me kind of find a starting point for the writing and to give it a style. Because when you haven't not used to writing these more kind of fictional narratives, it can be difficult to work out, okay, where should I start? Um, so these had different formats here, as you can see from a TED talk to a magazine article. And then I also use different archetypes because I've been reading so much um, science and media around the oceans. It was clear that there are these different kinds of archetypes. They all have particular kind of characteristics that you could build into defining who the kind of core protagonists or characters of each of these future narratives was. Um, so, so that was really my, my starting point for building those out. Uh, and now I'm going to go through each of the scenarios. As I go through them, um, I'm actually going to play a short excerpt, uh, and then I'll show you the kind of image associated with the scenario, uh, and then share some thinking as to what the kind of core point 
that it's trying to get across is. Astrid Amundsen was undoubtedly one of the most polarizing corporate leaders in modern history, and her legacy will remain complicated. There is no doubt that her efforts saved the lives of millions, but the ultimate cost to marine ecosystems is still unknown. Perhaps Astrid's attack on the jellyfish deserts will outweigh the damage of her relentless efforts to farm the seas. As she left this world forever, Astrid knew that she had been able to do what no one else could and that she achieved her goal with single-minded purpose and clarity. I, on the other hand, am worried that big solutions beget big problems and Astrid is gone. So this first narrative I mentioned kind of at the beginning about this gold rush, the the ocean as being this uh, frontier space where people want to create opportunities, create fortunes. Uh, and there's a lot of um, narratives around that you can farm the ocean, that we should industrialize it, that it's where the source of marine protein comes from. So the purpose of this kind of future scenario was to kind of test and challenge that using the science of what we know is happening and might happen and then kind of creatively speculating beyond that, what actually would be the implications if a very large kind of consolidated fishing firm was to take on this responsibility to essentially privatize world food security through the ocean? And what might be the, the downsides of that? So it's, again, taking something like a core idea of the blue economy and then actually really trying to use uh, futures as a way to kind of explore that and see and to challenge and create questions. And and the real purpose of of working with this Swedish concept artist Simon Stolenhog to develop these images was to allow that even those who hadn't read the scientific paper or hadn't read the narratives, you could put these images up and everyone can say something about the future. It provokes something. Uh, using art can really get people to, to think and engage in sort of questions and issues that maybe before they had no interest in or didn't feel like they had the knowledge uh, with which to say anything. But storytelling is something that is kind of innate to us humans. And if you can find ways to activate that capacity, uh, then that's a really great way to, as I said, engage people in issues and also to build futures literacy. On to the next scenario. I am now director of the Ocean Stewardship Foundation. I oversee a small fleet of ocean-going vessels. I like to call this my blue flag fleet, rejuvenating the seven seas. Jointly funded by everyone on Earth, the foundation is housed in a state-of-the-art floating campus, spending most of the year somewhere in the South China Sea. But we are able to move around as we hold seminar series, conferences and other events across the region. When my rebellious side takes over, I like to think about my distant ancestor, Qing Xi. She was a brave, singular and remarkable person. To bring the oceans back from the brink of disaster as we have done, we are called upon our own pirate spirit, our bravery, audaciousness, and vision. And rather than plunder the oceans, today we can stand and look with wonder at the good we have achieved together. So this scenario is, if you look at this future, and all of these scenarios were set in 2050 to 2070, because I like to work uh, you know, given that it is a science fiction thing quite further in the future. But the thing is, a lot of the science and what we know is already kind of indicating um, that there, there, there's a lot of changes going on. And if you look at the seeds of different technologies that are being developed, it's not so difficult to build out a science fiction narrative. Also, I find that sometimes working too close to the present means that even though change can be fairly radical on a short time, people uh, sometimes expect certain things to change a lot faster than they do and other things to go a lot slower. Uh, and also setting it further in the future can open up people's minds and allow them to gauge more creatively and not get so stuck in the constraints of the present. But if we look at this image, and this is set in 2070, there's one thing that feels very unrealistic from a scientific perspective, which is that there's still a flourishing coral reef. A lot of the science tells us that coral reefs, tropical coral reefs are likely to collapse before 2050. Uh, so what this scenario is really playing with the idea of is, okay, 
if we were to create a future where we do have flourishing tropical coral reefs, what kind of combination of human ingenuity, technology, institutions, financing, uh, ecosystem adaptation, and what all of those things would have needed to come together in order to, to be able to try to make that a bit more of a plausible reality? And this is a really way to try to provoke and use futures as a way to say like, okay, these are the kinds of policy things that if we can start with them now, we have a better chance of actually being able to secure the kind of future we want. It's not a guarantee, of course, but it certainly helps. And one thing I work with across all the scenarios is obviously having things that were quite different between them, but also a set of critical, uh, critical sorry, to have a set of critical uncertainties, but also things that are consistent across the scenarios. None of these scenarios magically make climate change disappear. It's still there, it's in the background. Uh, and I think that that's also important uh, when working with these things to, to work out what actually needs to be consistent, what's already baked in from an Earth system perspective, that no matter what we think we can do with technology, uh, we can't change. Moving on to the third scenario. There was nothing in sight for miles. Then, Three ocean giants just floating, their last refuge in the southern ocean failing them. These seas were all the acid in the oceans really screwed everything up. The krill had no time to adapt, they just dissolved into nothingness, with not a hint of protest. We didn't hunt them, but humanity killed the krill all the same. We burned the whales' food and laced their homes with acid. I know it's rare to even see whales anymore, since most have died and sunk like stones to rot in the ocean floor. Whale fall, harboring islands of life in a vast emptiness. But I don't want to see them, rare or otherwise. So this is obviously not a super happy future narrative. Um, and what I think I can say also across all the narratives, they are more utopian or dystopian but I, I really have started to use this term polytopia a lot more that I think the future is, has winners and losers uh the future can be utopian for some and other people's dystopia so I found the kind of binary between them not so so useful uh, so I think of them all to exist in the same kind of space and that they all have utopian and dystopian elements but this one for sure is the most dystopian I mentioned when I was kind of giving the ocean context that there's these marine tipping points and the idea that you can actually shift uh, so this story tries to explore the idea because people really struggle to see how things work together. They can see ocean acidification or they can see deoxygenation or they can see uh, biodiversity loss. But it's very hard to see what happens with all of those things are happening together. And here, this story tries to explore through the the uh, journals of this last ocean fisherman how an oceanic death spiral might occur. So it's a lament uh, for an ocean that we haven't yet lost and a way to try to use feelings of loss and sadness and things to try to, again, uh, provoke action. Because I think there's a lot of different emotions that activate different kinds of people. And I was really trying to explore and play with different kinds of approaches in the future stories, uh, while also being reflective of one potential, quite plausible scientific scenario based on what we know. Last narrative now. I'm almost done. Earth's climate has yet to stabilize from the release of meltwater from Antarctica and Greenland. A hiccuping thermohaline circulation wreaks periodic havoc on the storm systems of the mid-latitudes. Meanwhile, the decarbonization of Earth's atmosphere continues, with corresponding greenhouse gas concentrations also falling. For the Oceania Confederation and all ocean dwellers, Less atmospheric CO2 means the eventual reversal of ocean acidification. Global fisheries, marine food webs, and coral reefs have a chance to thrive again, dependent, of course, on whether humanity has learned anything from its brush with collapse. So this final scenario is quite personal to me. I, I come from New Zealand, and, you know, we're surrounded by communities in Micronesia, Polynesia, uh, and 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 others and the French Polynesia and often the kind of narrative right now for many of these people is like oh okay you're the the very sharp end of climate change your uh, places you live are going to be no more due to sea level rise and then you're all going to become refugees um, and so this was trying to play with an alternate 
idea of what kind of forces and potential exists in informal governance institutions under the law of the sea, technology, different kinds of unusual alliances to come together and rebuild and build a different kind of civilization in the South Pacific. Uh, here they build it under the ocean, but it could just as easily be on top. The specifics are less important than the ideas behind it. Um, so here it's about exploring this Oceania Confederation that sits on the one of the last major by uh, reserves of biodiversity in the ocean and how they've kind of like built something which is a respects all of the different kind of cultures and indigenous knowledge and, and different things and actually build something new uh, you know and refuse to become kind of climate refugees or victims of this um, this change which is not at all uh, something they've caused uh, so that's what that scenario is, is getting at um, so I now just wanted to go through a little bit by way of wrapping up a few some of the impact um, of the the project. Uh, the project has been running for a few years now, and it continues to have a life of its own um, in terms of being in different uh, on podcasts and radio and media. And I had a, a sort of the project was launched in Wired, and then a couple of years later, uh, there was an editorial in Nature. Uh, about really sort of imploring uh, scientists to be willing to use science stories in order to kind of really uh, show and and have an impact of their work out in the world. Um, and also, so a number of different kinds of uh, impacts there uh, in media. And then also the project has been sort of exhibited. The, I actually got a chance to kind of exhibit it in the General Assembly Hall uh, of the first ever Oceans Conference. I'm showing it there in the left-hand picture to the uh, President of the General Assembly. Um, and then Falling Walls, which is a big conference in Berlin. Uh, and then it's been involved in a number of exhibitions as well. And the latest one actually was as part of a an exhibition called Science Fiction Voyage to the Edge of Imagination, uh, edge of imagination uh, at the London Science Museum. Uh, and that will actually tour around science museums around the world. So it continues to have kind of impact. And a lot of that impact is because I had the opportunity to work with a really amazing concept artist where, yes, all of the stuff behind it is important, but the first way that people engage with a project and what actually connects them is not how brilliant the futures are. I'm joking, of course. I just mean sometimes no matter the quality of the work you do, if you don't have a way to cut through and connect to people, then they never see it. And that has been what has driven the impact across this whole, th um, through these last years. Um, and I've also done some sort of follow-up projects with other master's students and really taking the approach that I did in the Ocean Futures project and applying it in different contexts. Uh, from this project by a, a master's student, uh, which does a different form of uh, futures of the high seas and, and using uh, science fiction prototyping, international policy making, and uh, different approaches. And this actually uses a really interesting combination of futures methods, uh, computation, uh, and narratives in art. Uh, this Living Infinite program, which is more policy focused, where we're actually working with operationalizing, uh, using science fiction prototyping to contribute to actually getting policymakers who are involved in the negotiations of the new high seas treaty to push harder and use more imagination led approaches to actually try to be more ambitious in what they were creating. So that's kind of an ongoing project. Uh, and then also a project that sort of spun off from this approach, which I've done uh, with Planethon uh, is I wrote these kind of future scenarios that were a little bit more focused on the food system uh, and then we went out with kind of a scenario briefing connection to the IPCC report uh, and and the full scenarios. And then sort of leading Swedish storytellers took that and wrote these kind of um, stories set in 2072 about different kinds of climate futures. And then Swedish uh, actors and performers performed them. Um, so trying to take that same approach of science and storytelling and use it in different kinds of contexts. So that's all I want to say today. I always find it weird when I have no idea. I can't see anyone and things, but I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussions. So thank you all for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. Um, now let's go ahead and open the floor for any questions, comments. Uh, feel free to unmute. 
or say something in the chat. Can I ask a question about um your storytelling? Oh, please. Um, uh, so I'm interested in learning more about it, and it's taken me back about 15 years doing um, uh, doing some workshops on storytelling as part of um, kind of a social history of some work that we that I've been involved in. Um, is them is what advice would you give on somebody who's just trying to pick that up again, or where can we go? Because it, it, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely with you on the power of stories, and um, and I know everybody here will be, but just that um, I'm sort of really interested in your slide. Uh, there was kind of one slide. It's kind of we start with the science, and then there's the bit about you know something the point of inflection and something changes and that's that's all you know fantastic storytellers just do that naturally don't they and they keep you captivated um but for you know lay people like me who are just thinking about that what what sort of advice would you give in in trying to pick that up Mm. I mean, so I'll just kind of make the point again that I think sometimes you need to find some some cheat codes for when you're starting out if it's not something you've done a lot of. So finding a kind of a format and um, and also giving yourself like some clear constraints. Like don't try to do something too ambitious for a start. Like, I mean, I, you know, so said like, okay, I'm going to limit myself to a thousand words and I'm going to take like a, a particular kind of format and then that's a great way to practice. And then you could try to, um if you have particular themes that you want to tell story like use the same format and tell stories on different themes using the same format and sticking to a thousand words so you like practice the kind of actual writing process and as you go through that are you going to understand a little bit more about um narrative structure and and things like that um so that's a really good way give yourself constraints don't be overly ambitious or put pressure on yourself to have to get it right um, straight away and then I think as you practice you'll you'll get more uh, another one that you always hear is read more um, if you so I don't know if you've heard of the hope I'm, I'm looking so you work within sort of social policy and uh, um, it's it's the thing I'm kind of working is the future of caring and how okay. do we connect more um, yeah because I you know, designing that in, in the environments that we live in because there's a really interesting uh sort of so there's solar punk which is more about like um eco futures but then there's something called hope punk which is also more about like social justice and different things which probably has a lot of overlap so taking the opportunity to read i know grist uh did a kind of anthology of um stories for our climate ancestors which was set 100 years in the in the future and i think they probably have a, a number of different elements of that are, that are relevant to kind of social care. So reading a lot of stories. Um, and then if you find one that really resonates with you in terms of the theme or the way that it's written, then you can use that kind of as a model to uh, to, to take and to start. Um, so I think that it's important also to, again, don't put pressure on yourself to be immediately creative. It's okay to take from others and learn what others have done. And then eventually you'll find your own kind of spark and that will, will pop up. Um, And then a final point I would just say is it might seem a little random, but I think one of the coolest things that's happened is the number of like live role-playing groups and how much that is. So if you go, there's an organization called uh, Critical Role. Um, They're on YouTube and they do live kind of role-playing where they like take on characters and tell stories and things. And even just watching excerpts of that and to see how people make kind of decisions, even if it's not thematically so close if it's random like orcs and fantasy thing it can actually still give you ideas and i also find that science fiction and fantasy can be interesting when you bring that into like something which is a very serious issue but it can give you a lot of really uh interesting angles that maybe you hadn't otherwise thought of like who are the 
you know, who are the protagonists, who are the antagonists, what's the kind of hero's journey look like, um, how are the heroes changing, what are the power imbalances, what are the kinds of ways in which you're trying to make change. So actually engaging in different kinds of storytelling cultures and then applying those to the mm -hmm. particular area that you're interested in telling a story around. Mm -hmm. um, fascinating topic, I'll, but I'll stop there. But those would be some just initial initial thoughts. Thank you. That's really helpful. If I can add something, it's a it's a tool that we use frequently when we're trying to work with people and get them into a future. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. They may not have been present when they were developed. It, we call it the day in the life. And you, you get people writing about what their life would be like or what somebody like them or what a particular person might be like in whatever future you're talking about. And you have questions that go with it, like what do you wear? Who do you talk to? How do you work? What kind of work do you do? To get them actually having a visceral feel of that future and it can be done relatively quickly. So you could do that yourself to try them out, kind of try them on like a different outfit. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic technique. Uh, for, absolutely. Th thank you so much for that contribution. And if I may jump in and start with Andrew, um, who asked me, asked me um, comment. Um, firstly, I think wonderful research. I really love that you you went through the exercise of um, from beginning sort of like where you are right now. Um, I was reflecting on Esme's question and your answer and Patricia jumped in and what was resonating with me is also bringing in the concept of uh, gamifying or playing uh, because you you sort of like touched that with role playing and I think when you engage a community or a team um, of using the sort of like a narrative and also asking them to play um, I think that's that's useful I, I wanted to ask Andrew um, in terms of impact and at the tail end of of this research and in the um, sort of the new mutations of where you are proceeding, um, mm. how would you probably engage a, a, a community or team uh, where they need to see this more clearly or have the agency to act on what they, they find? Because um, it's one thing for them to probably read and hear, but sort of like where where do you give them the, um, the action point, so to speak, after they've experienced it or understood what you're trying to say with this? And this is the, okay, now, you know, the community should should be going. So where, where does that, uh, or what are the, um, the, the tools implement that you, you think a, a team could have at the tail end of the process of learning that and asking them to act on the, what they've learned? No, that's a that's a really important question, and I and I think that um, it it's definitely that like because of where this kind of came out of, um, mm -hmm. I did it as a quite non participatory process, but I of course uh, see the value of of that, and I think what's actually been really interesting is to watch how, uh, as I said, a lot of my my students have been kind of using it in different sorts of participatory ways, uh, but also the potential to kind of there's nothing in the approach that says it can't be much more participatory and really focus on on impact. Um, so, I mean, a lot of it, I think, is also realizing, like, if I, when I'm working with this kind of more, like, with smaller groups or actually wanting them to kind of take action or think about, okay, uh, as, a, as a community, as a group of policymakers around ocean, as a startup with an ocean technology, whatever it might be, uh, then I think that it's, of course, important to present these kinds of scenarios as provocations and starting points that they can then kind of deconstruct and reassemble based on their way of seeing the world and their reality and and then and then work out like okay so what elements of this thing can i actually take into into action so often it can be about presenting them as as a starting point and then having them go through a process of actually coming up with their own kind of scenarios or even using the images and then and then building out um building out a different version from from there and then working with them in more of kind of a backcasting approach to actually say okay uh, so if this is the future that you've identified and these are the different elements how will you uh go about um how will you go about like getting there and what kind of action points do you need to do to do right now then 
it's really interesting to think about how these kinds of approaches play out in very different kind of power contexts. I have um, a student who's right now using this kind of uh, imagination or creative approach in the Colombian Amazon, working with indigenous women, uh, who many of whom under are under actual physical threat uh, from, and, and there's a lot of forces. So for them, the the chance to kind of, the, the, you, there's so much delicacy in terms of giving people, like letting people imagine and be part of this process, but not to immediately kind of respond by saying, well, I don't have any agency or how how do I have any power? Like there's people literally with guns and bulldozers who are coming into my community and trying to kind of knock this down. So it's been really interesting actually to learn from how they over a process of time are able to kind of use this kind of these futuring approaches to build like agency and for them to start to see different possibilities that they didn't sort of see at the beginning uh, where they can kind of like work out, okay, where can we push against the power structures or how might we do this and working in those kind of future scenarios, like allows them to, to do that. Um, so I think that um, I would say that this project it's been really interesting to see how people have taken up and gone a lot further than I have in terms of actually being able to create uh, impact with with different communities and um, and, and get them to work out how to, to take action. And you're absolutely right that just presenting kind of future images to people doesn't activate their own agency. So that has to be, you know, a set of steps, steps beyond that. And it's something also that I hope to keep, uh, keep working with as well. Perfect. Thanks, Andrew. Andrew, um, I actually have a question of uh, myself. Um, this is more regarding the imagery that was used uh, for the scenarios that you developed. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned earlier about how uh, those images, it doesn't necessarily uh, illustrate something specific, but it gives whoever's viewing it a chance to like immerse themselves. Um, into that scenario and just create their own kind of environment there. But what was the process of getting to that imagery? And what was what was the process of getting to that imagery? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so as I said, I mean, I worked with, I don't know if anyone knows him, Simon Stolenhag. He's like a Swedish uh, concept artist. He's become... Uh, like I really got him at a lucky time in his career. He's been um, very successful. But what when I was first realized that I needed to find uh, that I wanted to have images, I came across his his work sort of by chance. And what I really liked about it is that it has this kind of it is futuristic, but it's also very much bedded in 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 the past. I mean, his classic images that sort of started off his career were, you know, like a policeman in a 1980s like small Swedish police car. Uh, in a classic uniform from the 80s in a field of grass and then this kind of robot in the middle of the field. And you're like, well, why is that there? So he has this, in some sense, like this element of kind of like grittiness and lived in and nostalgia, but he also says something interesting about the about the future. So I, I really liked his work. And in the process with him was really interesting because he has such strong integrity as an artist that I think one of the dangers, especially when you're trying to come up with images of the future, is to try to jam too many things into it. That you would say, well, and I did that while I was working on those. Like, but okay, but this is also part of the scenario, and this and this. And I'm like, what about if we have this? He's like, okay, you can add all of that stuff in, but it's not going to be very, it's not going to work for the composition of the image. It's not going to tell like one story. You're going to be telling 50 different stories. People won't know where to put their eye, and there won't be any kind of emotional sense so he's like i will do this because you've commissioned me but if i if you want me as an artist to feel like i can fully stand behind this work and that it represents my artistic integrity then i would suggest that you follow uh, what what i say and so that was a really really great wake up call actually to work out what what does the image like need to do and and really you need to be able to kill your darlings and and really pair it all the way back and and so that each of those images i think is successful because it does evoke a particular feeling 
there's a lot of kind of mystery, but it doesn't actually tell you everything that's going on. There's many different ways in which you could interpret it. So I think that um, that has worked really, really well because they stand up as, as images. So I think that that has been an interesting learning for me working in an art science process to really trust kind of the artist and let them follow their kind of integrity and process. And then you have the best chance of actually getting something that, that works really well. Um, and I mean, it's interesting because I didn't, when I commissioned him, I was like, oh, cool to get some images for the snows, but I didn't really see it as an artistic piece. Um, but other people have. And so it's been in a number of different art exhibitions um, and featured in that way. So it's interesting, again, when you sort of trust the artist, it then ends up having a different kind of life than one you would have expected. Uh, so it took me about, I think, a month or so for each image to with going back and forth with the artist and doing different iterations and sharing references and images and so forth. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I don't see any more questions um, in the chat. Uh, so with that, I think we're done. So thank you everyone again for joining us today. Um, and thank you again, Andrew, for uh, sharing us your uh, your wonderful work. Um, would you share, want to share any last words before we conclude? Uh, no, I think I've I've said, but just yeah, really appreciate everyone um, listening and and all the questions, and I look forward to following uh, what other people are doing as well. There's so many exciting things going on in this space right now. It's, I was saying before the co started that. I have this constant feeling of FOMO because it's difficult to kind of keep up. And there's so many projects that I would love to read. There's so many amazing like science fiction on the future. There's like different cool things happening and you sort of, it can be hard to, to keep up. I can never absorb enough, um, which is, is frustrating. So I think that, um, but it's great to have these kinds of forums where we have the opportunity to share as much of all the interesting work that people are doing, even if we don't always have the opportunity to absorb as much of it as we'd like. Yeah, and I just wanted to just uh, pipe in uh, you mentioning, Andrew, uh, science fiction prototyping by Brian David Johnson as a reference. Um, I think uh, we should just uh, take note of that one because I, I love the reference of that one. And I think the framework that he proposed on, on, on this and how you encourage that, I think that's quite useful. Yeah. But any other reference that you wanted to just like, add on probably uh, aside from Johnson's book? Yeah. Um... No, I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of different things. I I mean, I know it's kind of boring, but probably I would just, if you can go to the, the paper, the actual published Ocean Futures paper, it's open mm -hmm. access, so you can check, maybe just run, scan through the references and see if there's anything that you find um, interesting. Um, in yeah. terms of sci-fi authors, I mean, obviously, Kim Stanley Robinson is doing interesting stuff and is actually engaging in a lot of more discussions around the kind of relationship mm. between science and yeah. science fiction yeah um, and then yeah and that grist anthology that i that i spoke about um but i can always we can always connect separately and i can sit if you let me know a little bit more about what you what you want i can always uh try to share some more specific things that might be interesting for you sure definitely we'll reach <laughs>